Hello, welcome to Programming for Engineers. I believe this is lecture six, and uh, we're going to get uh, into some really, actually, we're getting to do some real engineering work now. So today we're going to solve the classic truss problem. And I'm saying the classic truss problem because this is just the classic that you typically do your first truss example with. And notice I've got a truss here with the setup of the nodes A, B, C, D, E. And what we're going to do is we're going to show how to solve for the force members of this truss if the truss is loaded with a load. So first thing let's do is let's just take a look at the geometry of this specific truss. Um, if you look at the geometry here, you'll see that I put in these red lines to kind of help with it. But um, typically the classic truss problem has a load here in the center, which means it's going to have two loads on the edges. Here, that would, of course, these two loads would have, these two forces up would have to sum to the force that's down right here. And then if this is a, just a, a linear, or just a straightforward truss, then this distance here, if I say that this half of this distance is one, or if I actually say the whole distance is two, well, that also means that this distance right here is two. So I've got one and a two, and as you can see, this is a, a, a Triangle's got a 90 degree right there, which means that this is going to be right here, the square root of 5. So that kind of tells you how you can write up your force vectors, which will be important when you're trying to solve for the loads of this truss. I'm not teaching the truss example. I'm kind of hoping that you've been through your classic engineering problems where this is just one of the classic problems that you do. How to do the forces on a truss. It's taught in statics. It's one of the easier problems that you do. It's a classic. It's done everywhere. Okay, so you can see how that works there. Now, let's just go ahead and take this truss here and let's load it up a little bit. So let's, I'm just going to make a dummy load here, which is the 10. And then I got to have then a load here of 5 and 5. And you can still see the geometries. And you can actually see the different uh, members here. And they're easy if you just say, okay, well, if I have A, B, C, D, E, then this member here and the forces along this member will just be called force of AB. B, D, A, C, C, E, and D, E. And you can also see the geometries as you go along. So how do you go about solving this? And really, I'm going to try to make your life easy. If you've solved this by hand, you know that it's a lot of just plugging and chugging and calculating. But let's, let's just kind of work our way through this. So um, let's just zoom in here and uh, let's take a look at right here at A. So if we we're going to sum the forces at A. Well, the truss isn't moving, so you know the summation of forces is going to be zero. So essentially, you're going to have the force AC here, and then you're going to have the force AB there. Now, just make sure that your forces have consistent signs. Um, I don't, you can't see it here, but remember there was an upward force here. We set it equal to five. It wouldn't matter because it's just going to be one half of the downward force if we choose to put a force in the center of the truss. But if you were to sum the forces at A in the Y direction, well, you've got uh, in the X direction, you had this force AC and this force AB. And knowing the geometry of the truss, which is important, this force here has got the magnitude of 1 over the square root of 5. And you can look at that because there's 1, and there's the square root of 5. And the force vectors follow the geometric rules of the geometry of the trusses. Again, I'm not going to get into that. That's in statics. That's where you learn how to do this. I'm going to show you just easy ways to solve this because this is programming for engineers. We haven't programmed yet. Well, in the solution, what you can do is you can do a summation of force at x and a summation of force at y. And if you actually take the summation of the forces at, uh, and you only have to do them at four of the nodes, a, b, c, and d, do a summation of force in x and a summation of four in y, you can get plenty of equations that you need to solve for the force directors. Now, if you force vectors, if you look one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's seven force vectors. We can work our way backwards up here. And you'll see that there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven trusses, meaning that there's going to be seven force vectors, which means that you're going to have to have seven equations with seven unknowns. And the best way to solve seven equations with seven unknowns is to go ahead and set up a matrix. So if I say the force vectors, A, C, A, B, B, C, B, D, C, D, C, E, and D, A, it doesn't matter what order you put these in. 
as long as you set up your matrix to be consistent. So if you actually looked down here at force of AC, you would actually see that force of AC shows up in two of the equations, one with a positive one, one with a minus one. That's, you know, if I did the summation of forces at A, B, C, and D. Okay, so that's that. It's just that simple. And if you were to put this in the form, let's just come up here so you can actually now see it. A, F equals B. A is this. B is this. This matrix of all these force vectors times the forces is going to be equal to the actual forces that you saw. The 10, 110 upward force, and one, the, the, I'm sorry, the 5 upward and the 10 downward force. You don't see the other 5 in there simply because we didn't need to write a summation of forces at node E because I had enough equations to solve if I just did A, B, C, and D. But that's it. I just write those summations at those nodes. I put them into the matrix formula, matrix uh, here. And then I can solve for the force vector right here. Now, the reason this is a great one for doing in Python is I'm going to now take this away and bring spider up over here so you can kind of see it here. So let me pull spider in so it fits within your window so you can see it. And let's look at how I can do this. Well, I need a couple of tools here that are built into Python. Okay, uh, math and numpy. Numpy, and I'm going to bring in numpy as np. That way I don't have to type out numpy every single time that I do it. I'm going to control enter, bring those in. Now I've got some little uh, stuff, you know, little fun stuff that they're going to learn later on about adding and just doing all sorts of types of matrix manipulations. But, but Python is really good, especially when you got numpy installed for doing matrix manipulation. But what we're going to do here is we're going to kind of work, not kind of, we're going to work on this series of the force vectors. And remember, um, if I were to say, you, if you look at the um, equation forms, you'll notice that 1 over the square root of 5 shows up in a bunch of places, and 2 over the square root of 5 shows up in a bunch of places. So what I'll do is I'll just write a force vector, F1 equal 1 over the square root of 5, and F2 which will be 2 over the square root of 5. And remember, in some places it was negative, in some places it was positive. But I can duplicate my force matrix here very easily in Python. And I even laid it out nicely by putting in enough spaces so that it all lines up nicely. Worth noting, bracket, 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 those reverse brackets let me put this on multiple lines. Also worth noting, a two-dimensional array is an array of arrays. So if you remember how we defined an array, we put the values into brackets. Well, a two-dimensional array is an array of arrays. So if you look right here, you'll notice that this little piece here is an array. Well, that is, if you look at it, that is this force vector, 1 minus uh, 1 over square root of 5, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? 1 minus F1, which is 1 over the square root of 5, which gives you that 1 over negative square root of 5, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and that is an array. But a two-dimensional array is an array of one-dimensional arrays. So you notice you've got a bracket here and a bracket down here. So all I've got is array, 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 array. I've got all those arrays in an array. I have an array of arrays, which is a two-dimensional array, which now can bring you to the ease of how do you do lots of dimensions? Well, an array, of a three-dimensional array is simply an array of two-dimensional arrays. And a four-dimensional array is simply an array of three-dimensional arrays. So your dimensions are never a problem. So what we'll do here is we'll go ahead and we'll bring these in. All right, this time I'm actually just executing directly by using the control enter. And if you look over here and how we're going to have to solve this, well, here's your force vectors. That's what we're solving for. We're trying to find these. Right here I've got the final B, which is the, uh, the final values of the external forces, 0, 5, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 10, 0. Well, that's easy to do. I'll just call this, I'll just make this one. And I'm using the N 
P to do this. I'm using my numpy to do this. So notice I'm doing it as a function, right? So if you look at this now, um, now in this case, the B came in as an integer, but it's still going to solve just fine. Um, and I bring it 0, 5, 0, 0, 0, 10, 0. If you want to make bring it in as an array of floats, you just got to put that 0, 0.0, 0 on the end of all, all of those. And now I'm going to have a little bit of fun with this because this is where I've got some really powerful tools. In my NumPy, and you should definitely, definitely look at all the functions you've got available to you in NumPy. There are lots of great functions. If you're an engineer, it's just nice to have. But what I got to first do is I got to find the inverse of A. Well, inside of NumPy, I've got a little bitty a section called lin, lin alg, which has the ability to take the inverse. So first thing I'll do here is I'm going to go ahead and bring the B in. And then I'm going to go ahead and take, and I'm going to make A1 equal to the inverse of A. And actually, if you look up here, I can bring up what that inverse array is going to look like. Okay, because I've got the variable explorer in my spider up and running. So my A matrix is right here, and my A inverse matrix is right here. And all I've really got to do now to solve this is take the dot product of the two, control enter, dot product will give me my force vector, and there it is. 2.5, 5.59, 5.595, 5.9, 2.5, and 5.59 are the forces on each of the members of those trusses. So, so as you can see, that, I did all that. Now, of course, I did have to sit down ahead of time and type up all those force vectors. But the reality is to sit down and do the summation of forces on each of those members takes all of a few minutes to do. It really does not take that long. So then if you lay it out nicely in a matrix, which just means writing down a table, and bring that matrix over here, you can see that it is extremely powerful on how to do this. Another thing that you can do is suppose the force vectors change. In other words, that 10 in the middle was, let's say, uh, little f equals 10.0. Well, the reality is, is that this is, that would now become little f, and this would now become minus, oh, I'm sorry, not minus, 0 0.5 times little f. Okay. Well, if I took this whole thing and just did it in one fell swoop, whoops, not delete it, um, control enter it. <laughs> okay, again, so wait, we'll do this all in one fell swoop. Control enter. Okay, now I've got those force vectors solved. Here they are. Okay, it doesn't, shouldn't surprise you that they didn't change. But now, suppose we decided that that force vector is going to be, that, that force that you've got in the middle is going to be something slightly different. Like, let's say, 20. Well, we would kind of expect that all those force vectors would double, but very easily I can now recalculate that force vector and there they all are. Isn't that nice? And they did, by the way, double. Um, also, if the geometry changes, well, those are all things that we can easily do. So what you've learned to do here is solve the classic trust problem, but you've learned to solve the classic trust problem using Python as your language and Spider as your editor. So now, just think of how much, this is a great calculator. And one thing I can also do is I can go to this window here and hit Control S and all my worksheet, all my equations, okay, everything that I have here has been set, saved. So I've saved my problem right there. So anyway, I uh, hope you are, enjoyed this lecture um, on in programming for engineers. I'll see you next time for lecture seven. Bye.